What's up YouTube, it's your boy Rhett, back at it again with another video. I've been in the Bitcoin space now since 2017 and I've seen countless people throughout my time in the Bitcoin space get hacked and lose their funds and lose access to their different accounts. And here in 2022, digital hygiene is more important than it ever has been before. If someone in your life, your parents, your siblings, someone you're dating, wasn't brushing their teeth every day, you'd be like, hey bro, brush your teeth, they're gonna fall out. And it should be the same thing with digital hygiene. A lot of us are surrounded by people who every day are doing the digital equivalent of not brushing their teeth. And it's up to us, the digital dentists, if you will, to raise awareness about these basic security practices. So if you guys watch the end of the video, I'll be covering what two-factor authentication is, and then we'll go through the three most common implementations of two-factor authentication so that you can get an understanding of what you should maybe be doing in your life. And these are methods that you can use to not only secure access to your cryptocurrency exchanges, but also to everything else that you're doing on the internet. So go down below and smash a like button for extended toothbrushing metaphors and let's level up your brains. So first of all, what is two-factor authentication? Two-factor authentication or 2FA is the idea that instead of authenticating yourself with one piece of information, like a password, you have to use two separate pieces of authentication for an application to know that you are who you are. The most common type of two-factor authentication that we've probably all dealt with here in the US is having to present a hundred different forms of identification to the people at the DMV when you're trying to get a driver's license. Not only do you need proof of identity, but you need a social security number and you need an electric bill and you need all these other crazy documents. And the government does this because they know that it's probably pretty easy for you to fake one piece of identification, but it would be hard for you to fake the seven or eight or 10 things that they're actually asking for you to give to them. They wanna make sure that you are who you are and that you're a legit person before they issue you a new piece of identification that is going to supersede all of those other pieces of identification in your everyday life. And the internet basically works the exact same way. Early on, websites just use usernames and passwords to verify who who you were, but as time went on, usernames and passwords started to get hacked and people started to lose access to the things that they had set up online. And as we started to put more and more important pieces of information online, like banking and identification services, it became very important to create more secure forms of authentication. Luckily for us, we have a very secure way to identify people digitally, and that's through something that's called public key cryptography, which if you're familiar with Bitcoin, public key cryptography is one of the main building blocks of Bitcoin and is what allows us to transfer large amounts of money to each other trustlessly across the world. And it's the reason why your Bitcoin wallet, if stored properly, will never be hacked. The idea behind public key cryptography is that I can create a really big number that you can never guess and that if every computer in the world worked together, they could never guess. And then using that really big number, I can use one-way hashing algorithms to create a slew of public keys so that anyone with this public key can verify quickly that I am the actual owner of the private key, but they can never recreate the private key from the public key because it's a one-way hash, right? You can create a public key from a private key, but you can never create a private key from a public key. So what the f does that mean? Basically, it means that on the internet, we don't need nine forms of authentication like the DMV does. We only need a username and password and one private key that generates lots of public keys that proves that we own something. If you're still not following, let's take a look at what this public and private key cryptography looks like in real life. The first example that you've definitely seen before is the idea of two-factor authentication through text messaging or email. If you go try to log into your bank account, you'll put in your username, you'll put in your password, and then they'll probably send you some six digit code to your cell phone number. You'll type in the code and they'll recognize that not only do you have the username and password to this account, but you are also within reach and you have easy access maybe to the phone number that's also linked with this account. And so they're pretty sure that based on those two pieces of information that you are in fact the person who owns the account. In this case, your bank, Fidelity for example, would have created the private key when you created the account. And then they're generating a new public key every 30 30 seconds or every one minute. And so whenever you try to log into Fidelity, they're sending you that public key to your authorized device, basically, in this case, your phone. And they're saying, oh yeah, you know the username and password will prove that you own the phone that's connected to this account. And so this second layer of information is much more secure than just having a username and password, especially having a low security username and password. And it's much more secure because no one can hack that private key, public key connection that Fidelity has created. Unfortunately, this text message 
messaging implementation of two-factor authentication is not as secure as any of the other two-factor authentications that we're going to look at on this list. And it's not because it's using a different public key, private key cryptography. It's because text messages are not secure. There's a very famous attack called a SIM swap attack where a bad guy is able to clone your phone number onto a dummy phone that he has bought, usually by tricking a customer support agent at a company like Verizon or AT&T. And then once they've created that clone of your phone on their dummy phone, they're able to receive the text message that Fidelity is going to send you. Same public key, private key cryptography, but now this time the bad guy has your phone copy basically on his phone. And now he's going to enter that public key and pretend that he's you basically. They didn't need to hack public key, private key cryptography. They just needed to hack your phone. Having text message based two-factor authentication is kind of like brushing with a manual toothbrush and never flossing. At least you're brushing, but your dentist is going to be pretty pissed at you and eventually you might get gum disease. What would be better is if the two-factor authentication was not linked to your phone number, but if it was linked to the physical device that you purchased. That way bad guys wouldn't be able to clone your phone onto a separate physical device. They would have to actually take your phone. And that's where services like Authy and Google Authenticator come into play. These are apps that you can download on your phone or tablet, and these apps will hold a bunch of different two-factor authentication codes for you. At participating websites, instead of waiting for a text message, you can just open your Authy app, click on the two-factor authentication for the corresponding website. That will copy the code, and then you can go paste it in the website, or you could enter it manually. This is, again, the exact same public key, private key cryptography that we talked about earlier. It's just the implementation now is done through an app instead of through text messaging. So you don't have to wait for text to come in. You don't have to have an active phone plan. And app-based two-factor authentication is safer because you're protected from SIM swap attacks. You do need to be careful with services like Authy that you're not exposing your Authy login credentials to the cloud and that you're not backing up your two-factor authentication to the cloud. Because obviously if it's in the cloud, it can be hacked and it defeats the whole purpose of storing these two-factor authentication codes on a physical device in the first place. So you wanna make sure you have that setting off and you wanna make sure that you're manually backing up your two-factor authentication once in a while. Google Authenticator doesn't really have this problem because it doesn't allow you the ease of access of backing your two-factor authentication codes up to the cloud. The huge problem that app-based two-factor authentication has is that if you accidentally throw your phone into the ocean, there go all your 2FA codes. And it's a huge pain in the ass to go to these websites after you've lost your two-factor authentication codes. They'll probably make you send some sort of hostage-style photo holding up a picture of yourself, your ID, and like the newspaper with today's date, and maybe a handwritten piece of paper saying, I threw my phone in the ocean and lost all my two-factor authentication codes, please let me in. And unfortunately, like we talked about earlier, app-based two-factor authentication is safe from SIM swapping, but it isn't safe from someone just straight up taking your phone. They would still need your passwords, but if someone just stole your phone, they would have access to theoretically all of your app-based two-factor authentication codes. And if you had weak passwords and weak protection just on your phone in general, these attackers might be able to get access to all of your different accounts. App-based two-factor authentication is kind of like getting in the habit of flossing. You're promoting good gum health and you no longer have pieces of six month old rotting shredded brisket stuck between your teeth, but your dentist is gonna keep nagging you to just get an electric toothbrush. That's gonna bring us to the electric toothbrush of two-factor authentication, a sentence that no other human in the history of the planet has ever said. Hardware two-factor authentication, woo. Hardware-based two-factor authentication is kind of like app-based two-factor authentication, but now it's no longer reliant on your mobile device. Instead, the public keys are scanned down onto this little device and they just sit there forever. I've seen people in the security community talk about using the same hardware two-factor authentication device for decades at a time. So this really is the perfect long-term solution to your two-factor authentication problem. I recently got this little YubiKey 5C. It might be so small that you can't even see it, but this is my first hardware two-factor authentication device. I'm wondering if I can click on it here. You really almost can't see it. It's very small. I'm afraid of dropping it because I might never find it again. Leave a comment down below if you're interested in me doing a review of this product and just learning more about how it works. But basically, if you use these hardware devices right, they can be used as a backup to your app-based two-factor authentication that lives on your phone. And so if you did ever just feed your phone to a squirrel or something, at least you'd have your YubiKey 5C sitting in a safe somewhere and you'd be able to easily restore all of those two-factor authentication connections. And unlike your phone, you don't need to worry about your YubiKey 5C getting stolen because it's probably not on you all the time. Obviously, if you are traveling around with something like this all the time and you might want to with something this small, you might want to just keep it permanently plugged into your laptop. You would have to worry about theft at that point. But really, if you set these up correctly, you should have a foolproof system where you've got a backup in a safe somewhere and 
maybe this one is sitting in your computer and you shouldn't be as over reliant on your cell phone to do all of these different things for you. Hardware two-factor authentication is the best implementation of public key cryptography that we talked about at the beginning. It gets rid of those other phone-based vulnerabilities that were introduced by the text message-based two-factor authentication and the app-based two-factor authentication. One way to make it stronger would be to create some sort of like multi-sig Bitcoin wallet setup where you're having like three of five hardware signatures that you need to log into an account, but that's definitely overkill. I would never do something like that, but I'm sure someone out there has done that before. Hopefully now you guys understand the importance of two-factor authentication, how it works and the different types. For all the Bitcoin homies out there, all of this might sound super familiar. It's basically the difference between letting someone else hold your private keys to your Bitcoin versus holding the private keys to your own Bitcoin in a mobile wallet, where if someone steals your phone and hacks the wallet, all your Bitcoin could be gone versus using a cold storage hardware wallet or the ultimate security solution several cold storage hardware wallets combined in a multi-sig. Like anything else in cybersecurity, this is a problem between convenience and security. Completely ignoring two-factor authentication is very convenient, but it's also not secure at all. Text messaging two-factor authentication might be a little bit less convenient. You do have to put in another piece of information, but it's still pretty convenient. You don't have to manage different two-factor authentication codes on your device. You don't have to worry about backing anything up, but it's really vulnerable to SIM swapping and it's not super secure. Secure. And then for a hardware device, like you might not want to go buy a hardware device and set it up with all the same two-factor authentication codes again. So maybe it's not very convenient, but it is super secure. Different people will land on different places on the convenience versus security spectrum. But as you continue to learn about these things and get more and more comfortable with the concepts, I do think that it is better to generally lean towards security. No one really cares about two-factor authentication until Russian troll farms hack your Instagram account and start spreading political propaganda to all your your friends and family. Then everyone cares about two-factor authentication. Couple quick recommendations for you guys here at the end. My favorite password manager and the one that I've been using for about three years now is called 1Password and it works on any operating system, which is why I like it. I can use it on Windows, I can use it on Mac, I can use it on iOS, and it works in every browser that I've ever tried it in. 1Password has made me much more confident that the passwords that I'm using are very, very secure. Before I was using basically the exact same password for everything, maybe with a couple different numbers at the end, but now I'm using these very complex passwords that would be very, very difficult to hack. And even if those passwords were hacked, 1Password actually shows me which passwords that I'm using have shown up in leaked password lists that have been used by hackers. 1Password also allows you to do app-based two-factor authentication all within the same platform. If you guys are interested in leveling up your password protection game, I'll leave a link to 1Password down in the description. In addition to 1Password, I do use Authy for my app-based two-factor authentication, and I'm using that YubiKey as a backup hardware two-factor authentication device. For the accounts that I wanna make, sure are super secure. If you guys want any standalone reviews for any of the products that we talked about today, go down below and leave a comment. I do still respond to all the comments. Also comment down below, are you guys using two-factor authentication? My audience is mostly Bitcoin focused people, so I'm hoping that most of you are using two-factor authentication. If you guys found this video helpful at all, or if you learned something today, go down below and smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. It really helps out the channel. And then come back here every Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern for new videos. I love you all. Goodbye.